Well, good evening. Thank you for joining us. I hope you can hear me loud and clear this evening. And we are continuing our series, Parables, Truths Hidden in Plain Sight. When the Lord Jesus was here, he often used everyday things to uh, teach eternal truths, to reveal things uh, that he wanted to teach the people. Tonight, our title is The Prayer God Always Answers. We're going to find that in Luke chapter 18, and we're going to read from verse 9. Luke chapter 18, verse 9. Also, Jesus spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat on his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Amen. The temple dominated the city of Jerusalem. Uh, dominated it physically, it stood over the whole city, but also its ritual and ceremony would dominate the life of the city. And so everyone visiting uh, Jerusalem would be drawn to the temple, and they would know that during the day there were set times called the hour of prayer. And on these occasions, the priest in the temple would be offering up a sacrifice, and the people would flock to the temple, and they would gather round about the temple, within the temple, in the temple court, and it was a time for prayer. And so when the Lord Jesus talks about people going up to the temple to pray, of course, this was an everyday occurrence, something the people were very used to and had witnessed and perhaps participated in many times visiting Jerusalem. It's very interesting. If you go to Jerusalem today, all that remains of a temple in Jerusalem is what is called the Western Wall. And of course, if you go to the Western Wall of Jerusalem, you'll find that that's what many of the people there are doing. They're going there to pray. And so the temple was seen as a kind of focus for people who went to pray. So the Lord Jesus, as he tells this parable, the story, Immediately his hearers know what he's talking about. It's the hour of prayer, and people are going up to the temple to pray. Now, the Lord Jesus too, chooses two men, uh, and these two men are at extreme ends of the religious spectrum. First of all, there's a Pharisee, and then there is a tax collector. Now, the Pharisee would be revered. He would be looked up to as a man of God. He was ultra-Orthodox, ultra-religious. And then at the very extreme end of the spectrum, there was the tax collector. Now, the tax collector was not revered. He was not looked up to. He was not thought of as a man of God. He was despised. And it wasn't simply because I don't suppose anyone likes paying tax. It wasn't anything to do with uh, paying tax. The fact of the matter was he was despised for two reasons. First of all, he was really a traitor. He was in the employ of the Roman army who were occupying Palestine, occupying Israel. And so for somebody to take their employment as a tax collector for the Romans, that was really the lowest of the low as far as the Jews were concerned. And then secondly, to compound that, uh, the tax collectors were very often skimmers. I don't mean they were skimming stones across a pond. I mean they were skimming off from the taxes they collected. Uh, some of it would go, I'm not sure what percentage, but some of it would go straight into their own pocket. And the people knew that. And they were being fleeced. And they were being fleeced by tax collectors who were traitorous in their view. And so uh, the idea of a Pharisee up at one end of the scale and down right at the bottom of the other end of the scale is a tax collector. And so the Lord Jesus sets this kind of polarized view of religious people coming up uh, to pray. 
Now let's just look briefly at what the Pharisee says, because he begins, first of all, by reminding God what he hadn't done. He says, God, I, I, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I don't do the things that other people do. I'm not uh, an adulterer. I'm not unjust. I'm not an extortioner. And out of the corner of his eye, he sees, he catches sight of this tax collector. He says, or even this tax collector, I'm not, I'm not a despicable person like this. And so he's telling God, first of all, the things that he doesn't do. And then he moves on to the things he does do. And he says, I fast twice in the week and I give tithes of all that I possess. And he's really approaching God on the basis that I'm not really a bad person. And in fact, I do some good things. Now, you would be shocked to realize how widespread that view is. I think that when, when the Lord Jesus told this and he repeats what the Pharisee says, I think the people will be smiling because uh, they'd heard prayers like that, that's for sure. <laughs> Maybe not just exactly in these words. They wouldn't be as, as blunt and black and white, but there was no doubt that uh, some of these Pharisees, they would just be sort of boasting to God about how good they were and how different they were from other people. They were very self-righteous. And it's interesting how that even in our hearts, this idea that I'm not just as bad as other people. You know, that's a, that's a very common mistake we fall into. <laughs> we can always look at other people and think, well, I'm not as bad as him. I'm not as bad as her. Yeah, nobody's perfect. We'll all admit that. No one's perfect. But, but there are lots of a lot worse people than me. And then we have this sneaking uh, view and sneaking suspicion that we're not really that bad after all. We do some pretty good things. And if you scratch the surface of our opinion about ourselves, very often we find that we're not far off what this Pharisee said. We think we're not as bad as other people. Well, we're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. But we're not as bad as other people. And secondly, we do some pretty good things. Actually, we're not, we're not bad. We're not really bad. And as this man prays, it's interesting, he says he prays with himself. The commentators are divided on what that means. Did it mean that his prayer just was really talking to himself? Or did it mean that he stood by himself? Uh, whichever way you look at it, I can tell you this. I don't think that prayer uh, cut much in heaven. I don't think it reached heaven with any approval. I don't think God paid much attention to that prayer. Dear friend, if we come to God trying to tell God that really we're different, that we're better, that we're good, that, that we've got some very good points, we'll find that prayer is not heard in heaven. I want to turn now and just think for a few moments about the prayer that God always answers. And it's the prayer of this tax collector. And his prayer is completely different. And it must have shocked the hearers as they listened to this parable being told to think that this religious man who knows his Bible so well and is such an orthodox religious Jew, to think that his prayer isn't reaching heaven. And yet here's this despicable tax collector. How could it possibly be? And I want to just point out there were three wonderful things about this man's prayer. The prayer that God always answers. First of all, he described himself in the right way. We'll start at the end of the prayer. He calls himself a sinner. Now, dear friends, that's a very emotive word these days. It seems a very uncouth word. It seems a very discourteous word to call somebody a sinner. That is a word that we don't like to use today. And quite sadly, sometimes even in religious circles, preachers don't talk about sin these days as much as they should, as much as they used to. We talk about weaknesses and we talk about, about tendencies and so on, preferences. And sometimes uh, people present the message of God, the message of the gospel, uh, just in order to make people feel good about themselves. God is not in the business of making us feel good about ourselves to begin with. He wants us to feel bad about ourselves. He wants us to realize that we are sinners. We can't escape the S word. We, we can't call a spade an excavation implement. We, we've got to call a spade a spade. And we've got to acknowledge if we're going to be blessed at all, if there's any hope of our prayer being heard in heaven, we've got to take this place that we describe ourselves as sinners. I wonder, is there somebody listening to me tonight thinking, well, you know, I don't believe in sin. I don't, I think it's an outmoded, outdated concept. I don't think that, dear friends, 
in our heart of hearts, we know that the Bible is absolutely true. All have sinned and come short of God's glory. And if I'm not willing, if I'm not willing to call myself a sinner, then I can just close it now and go away and go back home because nothing I say to God will be heard. I must describe myself in the right way. And there's something else here, because the scholars tell us that literally what this man is saying is not a sinner, but he's saying, God be merciful to me, the sinner. In other words, he's saying, it's as though I'm the only one. He's not interested in how bad other people are like the Pharisee. He's really focused on himself, and he's saying, as far as I'm concerned, I am the sinner. And I wonder, it's quite easy to lump ourselves in with everyone and say, well, we're all sinners. Of course, we're all sinners. It's a different thing to see myself as an individual in the sight of God and to say, yes, I am the sinner. I wonder, are you prepared to describe yourself in that way? You see, the Lord Jesus said at the end of this parable that whoever humbles himself, whoever gets down before God and confesses, yes, I'm not just a sinner, I am the sinner. I am the sinner. I've done things that are wrong. I've thought things that are wrong. I've broken your law. I've disobeyed your commandments. I am the sinner. But not only does he describe himself in the right way, the second point is this, that he asks for the right thing. He didn't ask for justice. He didn't ask for God to be fair. He didn't ask to get what he deserved. You know, people think, if I just get what I deserve, I'll be fine. You won't, dear friend. Never ask God to give you what you deserve, because you'd be absolutely shocked if God gave you what you deserved. This man asks for mercy. That's what he asked for. He asked for mercy. And mercy simply means withholding the punishment that I deserve. And so here is a man who recognizes that he is the sinner. That's why he's standing right at the back. And that's why he's, he's beating his chest as he, as he can't even lift up his eyes to heaven. He is the sinner. And he is throwing himself on not God's justice, He's throwing himself on God's mercy. He's asking for the right thing. I wonder if you remember the story of King David from the Old Testament. King David, he committed a dreadful sin. He committed adultery with another man's wife. And then he arranged for this woman's husband to be killed on the battlefield. He basically committed murder by proxy. And it was a dreadful, shameful a sordid episode in the life of David. And to make matters worse, he just tried to cover it up and tried to carry on as though nothing was wrong. And one day, God sent the prophet Nathan to him. And I'm not going to go into the details, but Nathan, in a wonderful way, just exposed David's guilt and brought him face to face with his sin. And David was devastated. And not long after that, might have even been exactly the same day, I don't know, but not long after that, he wrote a psalm, and it's psalm number 51. You should have a read of it, because it is wet with his bitter tears, and David begins, and this is how he starts the psalm, have mercy on me, O God. He realized that I deserve God's judgment, I deserve God's punishment, and he says, I've got no nothing to claim from God, I'm not asking to get what I deserve, because I deserve God's justice and God's judgment, but I'm crying to God for mercy. I'll tell you, dear friend, that's a plea that God loves to hear. That's something God loves to hear. When someone says, yes, I'm the sinner, I'm guilty. I take responsibility for my actions and for my life. I'm not blaming other people. I'm not trying to hide in the crowd. I am the sinner, and I'm coming to God, and I'm saying, don't give me what I deserve. I want mercy. The story is told uh, back in the old times. I think it was Spurgeon, the preacher, who told the story about a man who, in the army, uh, was about to be executed for some crime that he'd committed. He'd been court-martialed, and his mother went to his commanding officer and pleaded for mercy. And the commanding officer said, Madam, he doesn't deserve mercy. And she replied, If he deserved it, it wouldn't be mercy. And the man thought for a minute, and he thought, That's absolutely right. Mercy is not deserved. Dear friends, you need to ask God for something you don't deserve. You need to throw yourself 
on the mercy of God. And so he describes himself in the right way. He asks for the right thing, but the, the most important part of this is this, that he asks for it on the right basis, because this word mercy is very important, it's very significant. It really means this, that this man is saying, God, be merciful to me on the basis, on the grounds of the sacrifice. And this man is not a theologian. He doesn't know much about theology, but he knows this, that God just can't sweep his sins under the carpet. He knows that the price has to be paid. He knows that the, the demands of justice have to be met. Somebody's got to pay for this. And I can just imagine him as he stands outside the temple and looks inside. What does he see inside? He sees the priest and the priest is taking a knife and he's, he's slicing into an animal. And then he's taking the body of that animal and he's placing it on the altar in the fire and, and it's, it's rising up. And suddenly the whole thing dawns on him and he says, that's what it is. That animal is paying the price for my sins. And so he says, God, be merciful to me, but not just any kind of vague mercy. Be merciful to me because of the sacrifice. That's what he's saying. Dear friends, I see not an altar, but a cross, and impaled on this crucifix is the Son of God, and he's dying on the cross for my sins. He's paying the price for my sins, my guilt. And when I come to God and say, I am the sinner, it was my sins that put him on the cross, and he paid the price there for my sins. And, and I come to God and I cry to God for mercy on the basis of the sacrifice of his son. That's wonderful. And I say to God, on the basis of the value of that sacrifice, I'm appealing, I'm crying for mercy. Dear friends, can I say this reverently? God cannot refuse such a request. The death of his son on the cross means so much to him. It is so valuable in his sight that when a sinner comes and says, I deserve judgment, but Jesus died for me on the cross, and I'm appealing for mercy on the grounds of the sacrifice of Christ. If I can say it reverently, God can do nothing else but answer that prayer. And so the Lord Jesus says, this man he got more than he asked for. He didn't just get mercy. He didn't just get forgiveness. He didn't just get pardon. That would be wonderful. The Lord Jesus says he went down to his house justified. You know what that means? That means that God gave him this position of being absolutely holy and perfect in his sight. <laughs> That's the wonderful thing about salvation. That's the wonderful thing about becoming a Christian. It's not just that God promises to forget your sins or remember them no more. He does. It's not just that God forgives your sins. He does. It's not just that God gives you pardon. He does. But he gives you far more than that. He makes you absolutely righteous in his sight. That's what it means. He declares you to be right with him. And nothing can change that. And he goes down to his house justified through this great appeal that he has made on the basis of the sacrifice. Now, before I end, I want to say this. There are no magic words. There are no magic words. You could repeat this prayer, God be merciful to me, a sinner. God be merciful to me, a sinner. You could repeat it every day of your life and it has not the slightest effect. There aren't magic words. You know, some people talk about the sinner's prayer and they bring out a wee card and they ask you to repeat these words. Now repeating words and saying words of themselves has never saved a single soul. It's never brought forgiveness to anybody. Because what this man said, his prayer, was the evidence of his trust in God and his faith that saves you. It's not how you pray. It's not the words that you use. You could, you could take his words and use them, and it has no effect because his words expressed his trust and his faith in the Lord Jesus. Now I wonder, as we close, have you ever prayed the prayer that God always answers?
Have you ever come to him? Maybe not using these words, using words of your own, but have you ever come to him and described yourself as a sinner and asked him for his mercy and trusted in the Lord Jesus who died on the cross for you, who died and rose again from the dead and who's alive today? And if you come and you pray in that way and trust in that way, then that is a prayer that is always answered. We're going to close now in prayer. If you've never come to God like the tax collector, you've maybe come to God in the past like the Pharisee and tried to say to God how good you are, come to God like the tax collector. And I can guarantee the word of God guarantees this. Your prayer, your trust will be heard and it will be recorded in heaven and you will be justified. Let's bow now in prayer. Father, we give thanks for these wonderful, simple stories, how the Lord Jesus told them so artlessly and yet so powerfully to bring home to the people their need of being made right with thee and coming just like the tax collector came. We pray that somebody perhaps listening to this tonight may come to thee in exactly the same way. Millions have done it down through the centuries, and we give thanks not one single soul has ever been disappointed or refused. We pray for thy blessing in the Lord's name. Amen.